I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we conclude, for real this time, our investigation into the murders of Mary Morris. Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, with my co-host, La Magnifique, Alice. <laughs> Brett, that was really good. At first, I thought you. you skipped you. the descriptor, and I was like, "Oh, uh-huh. that's so sad." We Aww, entered a you were era disappointed. <laughs> where I'm not like even worth a descriptor, but that was really that was like good pronunciation and everything. Yeah. Shout out to Gail, who sent me a number of French uh, superlatives I can use with Alice. So we may we may see some more of those later. If you guys are listening in various foreign countries and you have words you want to force me to pronounce, <laughs> send them my way, and I promise you I will use them. I love the multicultural aspect, the international flavor of our podcast, Alice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, it is really fun. Uh, getting all these cool perspectives from all over the world and some really cool um, uh, true crime suggestions from all over the world that I wouldn't have known of otherwise. Yeah, we've got some great international cases that we're going to have to do at some point. A lot of you guys have been reaching out with those cases, cases that are really famous in the countries that you live in but haven't necessarily been um, explored that much in the American podcasting world. So I think we're definitely going to do some of those. We love a good international mystery. So we're always happy to look at those. If you guys have those cases, make sure you send them our way. But today we're staying very much in the United States, in the great state of Texas, the Mary Morris murders. We're going to wrap those up today. However long it takes, we'll finish that up and give you some of our perspectives. We have spent a couple episodes on this. The first episode was very much sort of the story as you normally hear it. Some of the factors that people often discuss when it comes to this case. And then the second episode, we started to break that down some, and we spent a lot of time on the first Mary Morris, who doesn't get a lot of attention. And I hope you guys enjoyed that and learned a lot of stuff you didn't know. Today, we're going to look at the second Mary Morris. And in doing so, we're also going to go beyond the story that you've heard, and we're going to add some perspective and and some information that really has not been out there. And I hope that when we're finished, all of you will look at this case in a new light. And it won't just be the, you know, the, the phone book murders or the hitman gone wrong murders, the Terminator murders, but it'll be two separate killings that need to be solved and can be solved if people put the resources towards them that they should. So as I said, let's let's start talking about the second murder. We talked about the first murder last time. That was Mary Lou Henderson Morris. You may recall she left her house to go to her job at a bank. She never arrived there. Several hours later, Her body was found in her burned out car on a deserted road about three miles from her home. The fire was so bad that her body was destroyed and there was no real way to tell how she was killed. Her daughter, a couple days after her funeral, called the coroner's office to see if she could recover her jewelry and was told, in a shock to her since she had seen her mother buried, that the jewelry would would be returned after her funeral, after what must have been some some great confusion on the part of everybody on the phone, it came to be known that this was a second Mary Morris who had died. I mean, can you imagine the shock and 
and just having buried your own mother and hearing something so distressing. Um, this is just the beginning of the strangeness, right? Right. Absolutely. And so you'd had these two women, the same name murdered within three days of each other. Some people would add in Houston, as we've discussed over our last two episodes, it wasn't really in Houston, but nevertheless, an interesting coincidence that has led many people to tie these murders together. And in the last episode and in this one, we've tried to separate them out and really talk about these deaths on their own terms. And so let's turn from Mary Lou Henderson Morris to Mary Teresa McGinnis Morris. Mary Lou Henderson Morris was killed on October 12th, 2000. Mary McGinnis Morris was murdered on October 16th, 2000. So just a few days later. Give you the basic story and then we're going to dive right into some of these things we've learned. So the basic story is Mary Morris, and I'm just going to call her Mary Morris, much like we did in the last episode. Mary Morris goes into the office on the weekend to meet a friend to give her her allergy shots. Afterwards, she runs some errands, which includes going to the Eckerd's. While she's at the Eckerd's, she calls her friend, the same friend that she had just given those shots to, to let her know that there's someone creepy who is following her. And she speculates, at least according to the friend, that this person might be an acquaintance of one of her co-workers, a man named Dwayne Young. She gets off the phone with her friend. She leaves the Eckerd's. Not too long afterwards, 10 minutes, 20 minutes afterwards, she calls 911. And the 911 call actually records her death. She is found later in her car, shot to death with her own gun. And that's when sort of the mystery began. And that's when people started tying these two murders together. Two women, same name, similar deaths. So let's talk about this case. And I think you can't talk about the, the second Mary Morris's death without talking about Dwayne Young. Dwayne Young is the person who worked with Mary in her office and is someone who ever since the Unsolved Mysteries episode came out has been a focus of a lot of attention and a lot of suspicion. So let's back up a little bit and talk about Mary Morris and her job. Mary Morris worked for Union Carbide. She was a nurse uh, who worked for that company and people who worked for the company could come to her and get medical care. She had two offices with Union Carbide that she worked at. The first one we talked about last time, Mary was from Sugarland, which is to the west of Houston. I think the sort of northwest of Houston. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. No, you got It's a really Alice. big suburb of Houston. A lot of people live there because there's good schools, but it's a, it's with traffic, it's a, quite a haul to get into, you know, downtown Houston. And she operated two clinics. One of them was in Houston. The other one was in Clear Lake. Now, where is Clear Lake? Alice? Clear Lake is itself. <laughs> I, I don't think you understand how many suburbs, even though I had lived in Houston at one point in my life, I can't get everything right. So, so there's, there's something called the loop and then there's, which is 610 highway. And then there's uh, highway eight, which is the same Houston tollway. It's outside of that loop. So there's two major loops that go around Houston and Clear Lake is outside the second one. It's closer to like the space center if that, you know, rings a bell to anybody, but it's south of Houston, about southeast. So it's southeast of Houston, Baytown. How would you describe Baytown's location? Baytown's also um, to the east, but it's more like straight east. So it's north of Clear Lake. They make kind of a triangle. Gotcha. So they don't border each other. No, no, they don't border each other. In fact, you have to cross water like a bridge uh, because the gulf opens up right there. And so to get from Clear Lake to Baytown, you have to cross over a bridge. Gotcha. So Clear Lake is where Mary Morris had her other clinic. And it was this clinic that Dwayne worked at. The story you hear when you listen to this is that Dwayne and Mary didn't get along. They had a very contentious relationship. 
At some point, Dwayne gets fired because he's harassing Mary, and he and instantly becomes a suspect when she disappears. And we even recalled or recounted some of that story to you in our first episode before we warned you that we didn't necessarily think that story was true. We reached out to Dwayne. We thought Dwayne's voice needed to be heard in all this. Dwayne, a lot of people involved in murders, they want nothing to do with it. They get as far away from it as possible. Dwayne has been very active in the community of folks looking into this case. Let me break in real quick because I feel like what you just said contradicts something you have told our listeners time and time again, which is that a lot of people who do commit murders like to show up for the aftermath. They like to come to the search party. They like to go to the press conferences. They like to kind of be in the background to see how their crime plays out. So how does what you just said comport with the idea that oftentimes the killers do like to reinsert themselves into the story? Well, I think a couple things on that. Number one, I'm not necessarily just talking about killers. I'm also just talking about anyone who has an involvement in a murder. A lot of people who, who didn't kill the person, if they're involved in something like this, they want to put it behind them. They don't really want anything to do with it. They don't want to talk to the press. They just want to forget about it, if that makes sense. It is certainly the case that a lot of people who, who do commit murders involve themselves in the investigation and want to be close to it because it's part of their sort of reliving the murder. Now, we're talking about murderers in a very, you know, broad net here. I think really when you talk about people like that, you're talking more thrill killers, sexuals, psychopaths, serial killers. Those are the people who tend to want to be close to the murderers that they commit. In fact, the opposite is true of people who are not killers. So somebody who is, is not naturally a killer and commits a murder, one of the things police look for are people who've left the area in the aftermath of a crime because what a lot of people who aren't, who aren't naturally killers but something happens and they commit a murder, they will try and get as far away from the murder as possible. So you have both sides of this. It's one of the reasons that behavioral sciences and this sort of way of looking at crime is so difficult because... You have different people who react in the exact opposite ways to, to cases. And you have to, you have to look at not only the crime itself, but the kind of killer you're looking for. If you're looking for someone who's a serial killer, then look for them to stick around, look for them to be involved in the investigation, look for them to be involved in the search for the body, that kind of thing. If you think it's a one-off crime, look for the opposite. Look for someone who tries to get away from the crime, avoid the scene of the crime, change their appearance change their job, move, like all the things sort of just to leave that behind. So it is interesting, but I think it is it is consistent in a weird way. No, oh, that's really interesting. It actually goes to going back all the way to our Maura Murray episodes when you had the theory that she hit Patrice Bassey and she's, you know, not a serial killer and that probably was an accident if it even happened. And so it would be consistent with what you're saying in terms of behavioral sciences that she would try to get away. Right, as opposed to stick around right. because that was an accident. Absolutely. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, hundred percent. Nice callback there to one of our prior episodes, <laughs> but I think that's I think that's one hundred percent true. But either way, in Dwayne's case, I don't think anybody thinks Dwayne's a serial killer. Um, even if even people who think Dwayne may have had some involvement in this, I don't think anybody thinks he's he's one of those people. And so, if you thought Dwayne was involved, maybe you would expect him to try and sort of move away, but that is not what he has done. He has been very involved in this case. There was an online community that grew up around this case in the aftermath of the Unsolved Mysteries episodes. Dwayne was very active on message boards discussing the case. You can read a lot of that. It's actually really fascinating because a lot of people who were related to the case ended up getting on these message boards and they were arguing with each other about the case. And so when I saw that, I thought Dwayne would want to talk. I thought Dwayne would want to share his view on this, and he absolutely did. We have talked to Dwayne a lot. Um, he's he sends a tons of tons of information about this case. He was happy to talk on the phone, and we really walked through with him. I talked to him on the phone. Um, and we really walked through with him this case and sort of his views on this case and the reason i asked him why are you so involved in this case why are you still talking about this case 20 years later and what he told me 
I thought was interesting, whether you think it's true or not. And it was essentially that people have thought he was involved in this case and involved in this crime since it happened 20 years ago. And everybody who talks about this presents him as suspect number one. And he wants this case solved because he wants to clear his name. I think that's interesting because I'll just go ahead and tell you. If Dwayne did this, and this is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but if Dwayne did this, he got away with it. It's 20 years later. They haven't solved it yet. He's been around the whole time. If there was evidence tying him to this murder, presumably they would have found it by now and they would have been able to convict him. So the smart thing to do if you're Dwayne is just to leave it behind. You got away with it and move on. But that's not what he's done. In fact, Dwayne, what he really wants is for this case to be reopened and for more resources to go to it. He's, 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 uh, I don't know what word eccentric might be a word that I would use to describe Dwayne. And he's made a lot of people angry. He's made a lot of people angry in this case because he is aggressive and he will tell you exactly who he thinks is responsible. Not only for the second Maura, or Maura Murray, the second Mary Morris murder, but the first one as well. He's made a lot of people angry in the family. He's made a lot of the friends of the two Mary Morrises angry. He's a polarizing figure, but it was interesting to talk to him. Now, the story you've been told is that Dwayne and Mary were enemies, that she hated him and was afraid of him, that they fought all the time, that there were sort of violent outbursts at the office, and... That is the story you've heard. It is not the story that Dwayne tells, whether you believe Dwayne or not. So in his telling, he and Mary were not enemies at all. In fact, he says that they were friends. Mary and Dwayne had even traveled, this is according to Dwayne, to Galveston in the days before she was killed for work. Specifically, Dwayne had ridden in Mary's car for that trip. At the time, the business was undergoing a transition, and it seemed that Mary was going to get a promotion. Dwayne says that they actually got along so well, she had asked Dwayne if he would come along with her um, once she was promoted. But Dwayne had some concerns. He'd come to realize that Mary was falsifying medical records, recording treatments that she'd never actually given, and he had reported her to one of his supervisors. And for Dwayne's part, he really wasn't actually interested in continuing to work at this company, and his contract was coming to an end. So Dwayne says that he left the company without any incident. There was no drama surrounding his leaving the company. Dwayne says that he was actually fishing with a friend the day that Mary was murdered. So that is his alibi, and there's no way he could have done it. Now, interestingly, the friend that he, Dwayne says he was with has since died, so it's actually impossible for us to verify his alibi. However, there is a division among the police who looked into this on whether Dwayne was involved. And this makes sense. Like Brett said, you know, Dwayne was looked at from, I think, the beginning. And one officer told an investigator, who we'll discuss more in just a little bit, that Dwayne was his primary suspect. In fact, this officer warned the investigator to stop talking to Dwayne as he was communicating with a murderer. But multiple other detectives told the same investiga investigator that they had cleared Dwayne years ago, that he's not a suspect, and they are certain he did not commit this crime. So this is Dwayne's story, which is very different. <laughs> Right. Dwayne's story is very different from the one you've heard before. And we talked about this investigator that we spoke to in the last episode. He has been very involved in the second investigation as well. And as we said, he has connections in the Houston Police Department. And those connections have told him some things which are interesting and unbelievable at times. But his understanding is that other than this one detective, the vast majority of people who work on this for Houston do not believe that Dwayne was involved. Doesn't necessarily mean they're right, but it is interesting. And when you add in this different story and this different take that Dwayne gives you, and you have to wonder, how accurate is that? And I think that brings us to Lori Gimmel. 
if you've seen the Unsolved Mysteries episode, Laurie Gimmel appears on camera. She talks about this case, and she talked to us as well. Now, who is Laurie Gimmel? Laurie worked for Union Carbide, though she had left the company at the time that Mary was killed. They had met through the company. According to Laurie, they were good friends. They were friendly. They got close pretty quickly. They had a lot of fun together. They would eat dinner together. They had been to each other's houses. Apparently, they had carved pumpkins just days before Mary was killed. Now, according... Now, let me just go ahead and tell you. Just go ahead and set the stage. Laurie and Dwayne do not like each other. In fact, I think Laurie and Dwayne probably, if you asked them who killed Barry Morris, they would tell you the other one. They are as, as opposite as they could be. But it was interesting to talk to Laurie because she confirmed certain parts of Dwayne's story. One thing she confirmed that Dwayne had said, and that is the opposite of the story we told you earlier and the story you probably heard, is Dwayne wasn't fired. Dwayne was not fired from Union Carvide. There was no great blow up between him and Mary. In fact, Dwayne's contract was coming to an end and he left the company voluntarily. The blow up that you often hear about is that Dwayne came to the company and he was so angry that he was banging on the windows outside and terrifying Mary. In reality, Mary, Dwayne had a time card. He needed to get the time card signed. He needed to get Mary's attention. He had shown up at the company and done what most people would do. You sort of wander around outside trying to knock on the windows to get somebody's attention. And Laurie confirmed that that was essentially what happened. Now, where they diverge is in whether or not at some point Mary became afraid of Dwayne. Remember, Dwayne's story is they were friends. They had traveled to Texas City near Galveston together to visit another Union Carbide office that at that time Mary had offered him a job. Dwayne, in his telling, I asked Dwayne, I said, look, this person's offered you a job. It's a good job. Why would you then turn her in for falsifying records, which he said he did and Laurie confirmed he did do. And he basically said, look, you can't do that. That's one of the main things in our profession is you can't falsify records. So when somebody does that, I'm going to turn them in, even if they offer me a job. And that rang true to me just because Alice, I mean, it's very similar in the legal profession. We you know, Ethics is sort of hammered into our heads and you just don't let stuff like that go or you're not supposed to. And I think that's similar to what Dwayne was saying. And I think, I mean, at least in the legal profession, I think it's the same in the medical profession. If you actually know of something that should be reported and you don't, it's it actually is then your problem as well, right? It's an ethics problem for right. a lawyer who doesn't report ethical issues that they see in their cases. And Laurie had told us that Mary had a good friend in the New Orleans office of Union Carbide and that she may have done some blood work for him or some prescriptions for him that she wasn't supposed to do, but she'd done them anyway, and that that was a possibility. Interestingly, even Lori is an example of Mary acting outside of what she was supposed to do. We mentioned earlier that Lori had stopped by for some allergy shots. It's often reported, and we even said, because this is the story as it's normally told, that Lori was there for a flu shot. She was actually there for an allergy shot. But here's the thing. Mary shouldn't have given her that allergy shot because Laurie had left the company. So Mary was doing this on sort of her own initiative. And in fact, she had given Laurie the allergy vials with the medication in them for her to take home because she was going to come to her home to administer them because she didn't want Laurie coming into the office to get it done. So it rings true to me. And you know what's really interesting about that? You're right, Brett. That really rang true to me was that I don't think Lori even recognized how that was outside of the normal course of medical practice, right? It, when she was telling it to us, she was like, well, oh, you know, no, no, um, Mary would never do something that would be reportable. You know, it's probably a misunderstanding. And then she told us, oh, actually, she did the same thing for me. And so I can very much imagine that even if Mary doesn't seem to be the type of person to break rules, clearly she did in this instance. And oftentimes these rules are not broken with any sort of malice. She was trying to help out her friend. And it sounds like maybe 
the falsifying of medical records for someone else was also a friend she was trying to help out. It sounds like she was a very, she was always looking to help out her friends. That's what Lori told us about Mary. Mary was loved. Everyone loved her and thought highly of her. She said hardly a a negative word could be heard about her because people just loved her. Whenever she walked in the office, um, you know, people would say, Mary, Mary, Mary. That was the kind of person she is. So I can imagine someone who is so beloved just wanting to help out a friend. And when it's on paper, black and white, it, it, it could potentially be, you know, not what you're supposed to do. Right. And Dwayne, you know, for whatever reason, wasn't just going to look the other way when this happened. Now, look, maybe it's because he didn't like Mary. Maybe it was because they'd had a lot of run-ins and he saw this as an opportunity to, to get even with her, or maybe he was just a stickler for the rules and he knew that was the right thing to do. I don't know exactly what was going on there, but the motive that is often ascribed to Dwayne, that he had this irrational hatred of Mary that had escalated into you know, fits of violence and he has to be escorted away and he's fired and all this other stuff that's set up doesn't seem to be accurate. Even from the telling of Lori, who, like I said, is not Dwayne's best friend. Now, look, this is not to say that Lori was all puppies and rainbows about Dwayne. She told us some things that's, that were concerning about conversations she had had with Mary in the days leading up to her death. And the story that she told about Dwayne was that their relationship had gotten progressively more strained, possibly because Dwayne had turned her in, which Mary knew about and talked to Lori about. And Dwayne, you know, he was, he was moving on from his job. He had other things going on in his life. He had reasons to be stressed. Now they had been together before. Uh, Mary had gone to a party. They spent time together. Mary had been out to Dwayne's boat. She had actually met the friend that we mentioned earlier, the one that Dwayne was fishing with that day. She had met him. So there were connections between them outside of work. But for whatever reason, according to Laurie, at this point, their relationship was strained. And it was strained to the point that Mary had supposedly asked her husband, Mike, to show her how to use a gun and had begun to carry that gun with her. Now, I found I, I find this part of the story to be pretty strange, Alice. I just I don't it's hard for me to place this in my common experience. Having someone that you're working with that you're afraid of enough to to want to have a gun to protect yourself. I don't know if you have thoughts on that or not. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, that felt strange because we asked Lori, is there anyone else that Mary talked to other than you who would know that she was this afraid of Dwayne? And she said she didn't think so. She named maybe one other coworker, but it was not common knowledge, she said. And if it had gotten that strained, um, it just seems like more people would know. There are other ways to report, especially in a large company. There's HR reporting. There's anonymous reports you can file within the company in order to alert someone without letting the person you're afraid of know. And and one other thing is that we asked Lori, is Mary the type of person who would carry a gun? And she said, absolutely not. Mary is the type of person who would try to talk through issues. She is not someone who would resort to violence or who would resort to carrying a gun around if she felt like there was an issue. So not only did it seem... Uh, strange for the situation, but also strange for Mary specifically. And no, Brett, I've never personally been in a situation where I felt so afraid for my life that I felt I needed to take matters into my own hand and carry a gun or a weapon whenever, whenever I was around a coworker. But I have had situations where there were coworkers acting strangely or gave me some concern. And my first thought was to actually just talk to someone above me in the office so that if something ever escalated someone else would know right I wouldn't just tell my friends and so I I don't know what about you have you ever faced a situation where you've had such friction with another coworker or someone you worked closely with I mean not to that level and but I think you're right if I did have that problem 
I think more people would know about it. Frankly, I mean, if you just think about coworkers you have issues with in general, not even to this level, you talk about them with other people. You know, it's interesting to me that the only people Mary seems to have really shared this with are Laurie and Mike, and that's it. And look, there's this incident. It's talked about a lot, and, and Laurie talked about it with us as well. And it's this notion that some days before Mary was killed, she went into her office and she found her pictures were all face down and written somewhere was death to her. Now, the story as it's normally told is that it's on a calendar sitting on Dwayne's desk. And to the extent Mary, it was interesting because Marilyn Blaylock, who we talked about before, she had heard the story as death to her was written on the day that her mother was killed. So you can imagine, you know, how she was probably told that because this is another sort of interesting fact that ties the two of them together, right? In reality, according to Laurie, it wasn't written on a calendar. It was written on a blotter, which is basically a blank piece of paper. I don't know what they used to use blotters for, to be frank. I don't know if <laughs> I actually, I just have no I idea, but it's Laurie, not a calendar. <laughs> I think Laurie mentioned that they, it was like the, sh the blank page in between pages. Mm, yeah, I guess to keep the ink from going through. Yeah, that would make sense. Um, Mary thought that Dwayne was responsible for this, at least according to Laurie. I don't know that anybody else really knew about this. I asked Dwayne about this, if it actually happened, if he knew whether this was true or false. And he really didn't know. He said, look, if the police say it happened, I guess it happened. Now, one thing Dwayne pointed out that I, I haven't really heard before and Laurie was not aware of. Mary's keys had gone missing. So Mary didn't know where her keys were. So somebody, if this is true, somebody had access to that office, assuming she didn't just misplace them. And the keys were found after Mary was killed. So the keys just sort of turned up again. So if you believe that, then there could have been someone else who went into that office and did this in an effort to sort of point the finger, possibly, at Dwayne. Now, according to Laurie, Things had gotten so bad with Dwayne that they were talking about this. And Laurie asked her whether or not she thought Dwayne could hurt her. And Mary said, and I quote, I think he could do a lot more than that. So I don't think there's any question about who think Laurie, who Laurie thinks is responsible for this, but I have my doubts. Having talked to Dwayne and read the things that Dwayne has written, I just felt like Dwayne, number one, was shooting me straight when I talked to him. Trying to decide whether someone's lying to you is a dangerous game. We do it all the time. Alice and I do it all the time. But usually we have evidence that helps us decide whether or not someone's telling us a lie. Yeah, Brett, you know, back to that instance of Imagine if this were you. You walk into your office and all of your pictures are face down and death to her is written somewhere on your desk. That is a very aggressive and dangerous, unhinged scene to walk into. For no one to know, it's, it, it really it, it blows my mind, especially Mary seems like an extrovert. Based on what we know about her personality, she seemed like an extrovert, so she's not some shy person who wouldn't tell anyone. This is the type of information you would just mention to other people. You would mention it if it were Dwayne, because he works with you in that small space where only you have you two have access. And you would certainly tell someone if you knew your keys were missing and it could have been someone other than Dwayne, because that's even more concerning if it's someone that you don't know, right? Someone who shouldn't have right. access to that area if anyone touched my desk really i would find it pretty aggressive not to mention the things that s supposedly were found so the fact that no one else really knows this story i, I find just a little bit hard to believe and, and here's my question if you were already afraid of somebody to the point that you'd asked your husband for a gun i mean number one can you imagine asking your husband for a gun and he says why and you're like because of a guy at work I mean, I know. What would you do? I'm pretty sure my husband would take action. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And 
Oh, that's a great point, Brett. I'm you're right. I mean, I don't I can't speak for you, but I'm pretty sure my husband would before he gave you the gun, he'd be like, Oh heck no and like go report it himself, either to the police or to HR or email someone within my office to be like, I can't be there all the time. Make sure you're watching out for her. Don't let her walk by herself after dark to her office if you know, or to her car if if he's there. I, I know he would take other steps and just be like, here's a loaded gun, honey. Good luck. Try to shoot for, you know, the core. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, where I grew up, a, a pickup truck full of guys would have shown up in Dwayne's yard and taken care of the problem. But <laughs> I wouldn't do that because I'm citified. I would call the police. You know, I would say there's a guy at my wife's work who wrote death to her on the blotter and she's terrified and I want you to do something about it. Right. I mean, at least like go talk to him. And here's another reason why I think someone above her would have been um, told about this. Remember, correct me if I'm wrong, Brett, the two of them worked in that backspace that only they had access to. Right. Were there any more people? I don't think so. I think it was just the two of them. And if that's the case, I would absolutely not want to work in a small space where only two people have access to. Um, and one of them is someone I think who's going to kill me. I would tell HR, look, don't let him know that I told you to move us, but I need to work somewhere different because I do not feel safe being in a secured part of the building where only he has access to. I would, I'd be like, tell him whatever you want. Tell him that you guys are short on space and you need to move me to a different office. But don't make me keep working there. And they kind of have to take action if they have an employee who says that they are fearful of their for their life. Absolutely. And look, let's just back up here for a second. Mary was killed in one of three ways. Either this is a random act of violence. She was killed by somebody, you know, carjacking or robbing her and they murdered her and moved on. She was killed by Dwayne. Or she was killed by somebody who knew Mary and Dwayne in this whole situation, right? One of those three things happened here. And let's eliminate random act of violence for a second. And we're trying to decide between Dwayne and this other thing. If someone killed her who knew her and knew about Dwayne and knew Dwayne was eccentric, everything that happened, you would expect to happen. Because this person, if they're being smart and they're trying to plan this murder and they want to murder Mary and they want to do it in a way they can get away with it, Leaving little, you know, breadcrumbs pointing towards the weird Canadian guy who works there is not a bad plan, you know, and doing these sort of these weird things to, to make this story work is not a bad plan. And I just wonder how seriously could Mary have really taken all this in reality at the time? I know in retrospect, it's built up as this big thing and she was fearful for her life and Dwayne was so dangerous. But at the time, if she really felt that way, why didn't she do any of the things you've said? Why didn't she talk to HR? Why didn't she talk to her bosses? Why didn't she call the police? And if she had done any of those things, why did the police never consider Dwayne a suspect? And the reason I say that is because that's what Lori told us. Laurie told us that the police never considered Dwayne to be a real suspect in this case. Now, from her perspective, that is a failing of the police, and the police should have looked at Dwayne. But I got to tell you, Dwayne is so obviously a suspect, if all these things are true, that I can't believe the police did not look at him seriously and basically eliminate him as a possibility. That's the only thing I could imagine have happened here because he is an obvious suspect. So remember what Dwayne said. Dwayne, in his telling, said that he was in Mary's car just a few days before her death to go down to Texas City for visiting another office. Interestingly, without us prompting, Lori told us um, somewhat of a similar story. Lori said that she and her wife and Mary's daughter were all in Mary's car to go to the Renaissance Festival just the day before Mary died. And, I mean, that's very interesting because both, you know, Dwayne and Lori are smart people, and by being in someone's car right before they're murdered would mean that your DNA is likely in their car. I don't know why. I don't know what DNA is found in Mary's car, but both of them have told us stories that would put their DNA in her car. 
Yeah, and it's funny because you say it was unprompted on on Lori's part when she told that story. It was unprompted when Dwayne told me that story as well. And I remember thinking when he said it, like, huh, that's convenient. You were in the car where she was killed. So if there are any fingerprints or DNA, you've accounted for that. And then Lori tells us the story about how she was in the car with Mary the day before. And I'm not saying either one of them are involved in this. Like I said, I think each of them thinks the other one is involved in this in some way. But it is interesting that both of them were in that car the day before. And I guess this sort of runs up to what Laurie was doing that day. So the day before they'd gone to the Renaissance Fair, this day, I think it was a Sunday. I don't think I'm making that up. I'm pretty sure it was on the weekend. And Laurie had met Mary at the Union Carbide office to get those allergy shots. And then after that, Laurie had left and she actually, I think she picked up some pies. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, she picked up a pie. So she yeah. headed back towards her house. She stopped and picked up a pie. She brought it home. Hours passed. She talked to Mary on the phone. And then all of a sudden, Mary has disappeared. Laurie then goes to Mary's house and actually spends the night with Katie, her daughter, while her husband's trying to to figure out what happened to Mary. According to Laurie, when she had that phone call with Mary, about nine minutes passed between when she had called and when Mary called 911. So when their call ended and when Mary called 911, about nine minutes had passed. Now, I had read before that it was more like 15 minutes or so had passed, but in any event, between, let's say, 9 and 15 minutes had passed between those two calls. Interestingly, talking to Lori about this call, and I'm sure Lori's thought about this call a lot, Mary calls her and says that there is a guy who is creeping her out. She's in the Eckerd. She had gone to the Kroger to pick up some stuff. Now she's in the Eckerd. And she says that this is someone, according to Lori, that this is someone she knows because she met them on with, with Dwayne. She is a friend of Dwayne's, and that's how she knows him. So at this point, Mary's talking to Laurie, and Laurie, Mary had intended to go back to work, and Laurie's like, look, why don't you just go back to work, turn off your computer, and go home? Just be done with it for the day. And she essentially says that's what she's going to do. At this point, she's about five minutes away from where Laurie lives. And Laurie talks about this, how she could have she could have met her if she'd wanted to her. And that would have been no big deal. Or she could have just said, she could have just said, stay at the Eckerd. Don't leave the Eckerd as long as you're you're worried. And I think this is something that's bothered Laurie, that she told her instead, just, you know, go back to work and turn off your computer. Because essentially after this call, at some point, Mary was intercepted by whoever it was who murdered her and her car was actually found on a little dirt road between the Eckerd and where Laurie lives. Laurie said she had driven by that dirt road every day on her way to work and she had never known it was there, but that's where they found Mary's car. Yeah, that was a piece of, that was a fact that I just had no idea that Lori was just five minutes from that Eckerd's when Mary had called her. And we actually asked, you know, why, why did Mary call you? Was it to tell you about this weird guy? Because I would think if you're calling your friend, you're not that worried, right? If I'm really worried about something, I'm not calling a friend to talk about it. I'm probably going to call the police, right? But she said that she didn't know why. It was probably she had missed a call from, they were talking about something else and she just mentioned that there was a guy who was creeping her out. I don't know what to make of that, Brett. Uh, like, everyone has feelings, right? When you've, um, if you're about to be jumped, if you're, if someone's following you, you have a feeling and you have a sense of how serious the situation is going to be. And we asked Lori, you know, why, why did she have to go turn off her computer? Wasn't there like a screensaver that would come on and it leaves a log on? And Lori said, you're right. The, her computer required a password. So she didn't necessarily need to shut down her computer for people not to be able to access it. It sounds like that 
no one could have accessed it. I'm not sure if she would have lost information if she didn't properly shut down or it was protocol, but Lori didn't tell us any of those things. She just said, you know, I've, I've racked my brain about this. I, I feel so guilty that I told her to go turn off her computer. But I, I still have a lot of questions about the computer shutting down. Yeah, and I don't know if it's just sort of trying to look back on the way things were with the way things are today. Certainly today, I would never go to my office to turn off my computer. I mean, that's just insane, right? Like, why would I even do that? It was 2000. I mean, that's like the Stone Age, right? <laughs> so I don't know if turning off your computer was a bigger deal back then and something people would have just wanted to do. But yeah, it is weird. I mean, it's, there's a lot of strange things about Mary's death. And one of them, there's always been this notion that the scene was staged to make it look like a suicide. Lori told us that it was possible Mary really was upset about Dwayne turning her in and that this could have been really bad from her for her. Apparently, the head of the company that she worked for was coming down to Houston and one of the things they wanted to do was meet with her and they were supposed to meet with her on the day that she the day after she went missing and there was some thought that at least on Laurie's part that this could have been a problem and so I, I just I just don't know I just but the weird thing about that is she also told us that the police told her that her clothes were ripped that she had defensive wounds that she had had the hell beat out of her and that then they shot her and if that's true Where's all this suicide stuff come in? I mean, how the two are not compatible. They're absolutely not. I mean, I'm just very confused by all of it. it, it I've based on the way she was killed. I just don't think that she was that it could have been a suicide. Now, interestingly, Lori did say that very few people. I think she may have said only two people knew where the gun was in Mary's car. And she said it would be Mary's husband and herself who knew where the where the gun was. Now, I don't put actually that much stock in this because I believe Mary's gun was underneath her, her seat. That's where most people keep their guns, to be honest. When, Brett, when we catch people who shouldn't have guns, like people dealing drugs, they usually have guns on them. And the first place they put it is they throw it under their seat, right? And they always claim, it's not my gun, it's not my car, but it's right under their seat. And even if they didn't right. throw it there because they saw police coming, they usually place it somewhere there because you want it to be easily accessible if you're sitting in the driver's seat to be able to reach down and pull it out and use it. And that's often a defense we hear when we find a gun in the car and someone's in the driver's seat and they claim the gun's not theirs because it's somewhere, say, in the passenger side of the back seat. They say, why would I possibly keep a gun there? I had no idea it was there. It's not my gun. That's a defense we hear a lot. But underneath your seat is, or underneath the driver's seat is basically where most people keep their guns if they have a gun in the car that they expect to use. And that's where her gun was, right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's where it was. The weird thing about it, I guess it could have just been luck i mean you're trying trying to imagine how she got killed and the guns underneath the seat did she pull the gun on somebody else and they take it away from her and then use it on her you know how exactly did this go down and it takes me back to the 911 call so we know that mary at some point called 911 and in fact according to police this 911 call recorded her death. One police officer said something about how chilling it was to listen to it. One thing that has not been reported up to this point is what Mary said. And it's interesting what she said. One of the things she said, according to people who have heard this tape, was, they are trying to kill me. And the use of the word they. Does that mean there were two people involved in this crime does it mean that it was someone she didn't know what do you think about that alice this is also hard because i think word choice is difficult to decipher especially in an emergency situation i don't know about you but 
I, and I think a lot of people use they, plural, when they're not sure if it's a man or woman, right? I, I hear this in like witness testimony often, even though it's a single person, I'll hear a witness say, they told me, and, I'll, and I have to specify, who's they? And they're like, the person who came to my door. I was like, but you said they, is it one or more people? And they're like, it, it's one person, but I don't know if it's a man or a woman. And so I... I, I don't I don't know um, I've just seen it enough times at witnesses where they choose the third the uh, plural because it doesn't have a gender when they're not sure of the gender when it's a single person have you ever had that situation yeah yeah I mean that's the thing about the English language it causes all sorts of problems these days that there's no good singular non-gendered pronoun right I mean, you're not going to say it. It is trying to kill me if you're talking about a person. <laughs> so it's either he, she, or they, and they isn't necessarily plural. Now, I will say this, but I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say. You're trying to figure out what someone would say to the police when they are at the most extreme need possible, and they're saying someone is trying to kill me. Would they say their name? Like if Dwayne was there and Dwayne was trying to kill her, would she say? Dwayne is trying to kill me, or would that not even seem like a piece of information she should share when she's really just trying to get help? She's not trying to provide evidence for the future. So I don't know. I, I just don't, I don't know how that plays, and I don't know what all it means, or if it means anything. Or, I mean, we don't know anything about the situation of when she said they, right? So it's possible that someone was tailing her really closely. And that could go to the not knowing the gender, not knowing if it's single or plural, right? If a car is like, I don't know, hitting the side of your car, running, trying to run you off the road. Uh, there's a difference between road rage and like killer road rage, right? And so if you're talking about a car where you don't know the, the people inside, if I didn't know who was in the car, I would probably say they rather than him or her or he or she. Right. I would too. I would too. That's a good point. And we just don't know enough about the circumstances of this the circumstances of this call to make a good judgment on this. Was was she driving when she made this call? Was she already stopped? I mean, how was she able to make this call in the middle of a murder? You know, someone's trying to kill her. And going back to the suicide thing, did she kill herself? I guess it's possible. There is a Sherlock Holmes. I think it's Sherlock Holmes. A Sherlock Holmes episode about someone who's killed on a bridge. And they basically, they have a gun, they tie a weight to it, they shoot themselves, and then the weight pulls the gun over the bridge and into the water. And they do this because they want people to think it's a murder. And Sherlock Holmes notices like a nick on the bridge where the gun hit it, and he figures it all out. Anyway, so they wanted, they wanted people to believe it's a murder. And, you know, if you're worried about, you want to commit suicide but you don't want to traumatize your daughter and you want your family to be able to collect on the insurance policy. Maybe you make this crazy 911 call and then kill yourself in the middle of it. I guess that's possible. It's so weird. I mean, the, the 911 call is very strange to me that in what is essentially a violent, seemingly spontaneous killing in which they use your own gun against you, your own gun against you, you're able to make a 911 call. It's a little weird to me. Yeah, but you know, something you said earlier, I think, um, I don't want it to get lost because I think it's it's very likely. We had mentioned that Lori said only a couple people knew where Mary's gun was. I think it is very likely if she had to be taught how to use a gun very close in time to her death, she probably was not gun proficient. She probably was not used to handling a gun, used to holding it up, used to shooting it, used to pointing it it at someone if she tried to pull it out to defend herself the if the killer had gun savvy could probably tell that she had no idea what she was doing and could probably have wrested it away from her easily and i think that's very much much more likely to have happened than someone knowing the gun was there reaching under you know her seat to grab the gun that they knew was there i think more likely she pulled it out probably didn't even have her hand on the trigger probably it wasn't even you know, cocked, it wasn't ready to shoot, and he could tell that, or she could tell that, and he just grabbed the gun from her and turned it on her. I think that's very likely. I think that's, I think it's certainly possible. Oh, I was just going to say, but it doesn't address the question about the call to 911. 
Yeah. The call to 911 is weird. You know, that's why I think that she probably called when whoever ultimately killed her was still in the car and she was still driving. And then I can imagine the dr- driving got so aggressive, maybe the phone got thrown to the floor or something and it was just, it just kept going. Yeah, I think that's possible. That makes sense. That's definitely a possibility that they sort of heard it over a, a discarded phone. Obviously, there's been a lot of focus on her husband. You would think if her husband was trying to kill her that she would say on the 911 call, my husband is trying to kill me. You could certainly see her saying something like that. We've talked a little bit about this. There's several things. We talked to Laurie about this, what, what she thought about this. Supposedly, her husband was at the movies with her daughter that day. They did like the movies. That was consistent with the kind of thing they would do. One thing that Laurie said I thought was interesting was that when Mary would work on the weekends, usually they would go with her. So her husband would have been with her ordinarily, but not on this day. A couple things that people have said, hard for us to prove or disprove, is the four-minute phone call, which a lot of people put a lot of stock into. It's the fact that her husband called her right around the time when she was being killed and was on the phone for four minutes. According to the phone company, that call was answered. According to the husband, it was not answered, and he just let the phone ring for four minutes. I don't know what you think about that, Alice. The only thing I could figure, if that were true, he had recently accused her of having an affair. And you could imagine he calls her, she's not answering, and he's thinking, I bet she's with whoever she's having an affair with. I'm going to let this phone ring until somebody answers it, by goodness. And he just lets it ring for four minutes. I mean, I guess that's possible. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I don't think I've ever let my phone ring for four minutes. The part I it, that's more confusing is that the phone company indicates that it was picked up i don't know if any anything weird could have happened in that right apparently she was supposed to be on a 911 call too so maybe if you're already on another call and a call beeps in it looks like you've answered i I have no idea but it's just confusing to me that it was answered um and even if you're mad at someone four minutes is a long time to commit to it because you have to keep your phone on for that long (laughs) you can't do anything else you know while you're you can't use your phone you can't call someone else you probably have to hold it put it to your ear to make sure no one answers because if you're really that angry you're ready to yell you know some expletives to whoever answers the phone so that's just a very long time to let a phone ring yeah it, it makes no sense it's the most damning piece of information against him you have the phone company saying it saying it was answered Could be a glitch, but man, what an unlucky glitch that is, right? (laughs) Where the phone company is saying it's answered when she's murdered, and you're saying, no, I let it ring for four minutes. When he was with his daughter at the movies, what is? how does he have four minutes just to let the phone ring? And he never says why he stopped listening after four minutes and why that was the end of that. He's very suspicious. The ring we talked about that was missing, apparently it ended up, with Katie, her daughter had the ring eventually, which has made people speculate that maybe the ring was recovered, and and that's how this went down. I mean, who knows, right? Who can who can say about that? Whether she always wore the ring or or didn't always wear the ring or whatnot. According to Laurie, Mike's always been the police chief suspect. He's been the one that they've looked at. From the beginning, and you can understand that just based on that's the way it always is. And look, they had they had problems. I think Mike would admit that. He had thought she was having an affair. He'd confronted her about that. She had denied it. Whether it's true or not, it's certainly something that he thought was possible. So who knows? It's hard to say. He didn't take a lie detector. I'm not going to blame him for that, even though some people will just because i would never have anybody take a lie detector but he's somebody that has to be looked at and he's somebody that should be looked at if the police reinvestigate this case i feel like we've sort of come full circle on this we've talked a lot about this case and and how she was killed if you believe that mike is a suspect and he's your chief suspect one thing i think we can say for sure mike did not kill her mike was with his daughter that day Mike has the perfect alibi, which means it had to be a hitman, right? (laughs) It's just coming all the way back to when we started. It has to be a hitman. And 
this once again fuels this whole notion of maybe this is a mistaken hitman case. And one piece of evidence that people have pointed to again and again and again that this is a hitman is the call that was supposedly made to the Houston Chronicle after the first Mary Morris was killed, but before the second Mary Morris was killed, saying they got the wrong Mary Morris. And that statement was confirmed by Laurie on the Unsolved Mysteries episode, where she said she spoke to someone at the Houston Chronicle who confirmed that that statement had been made. This is incredibly important, whether that statement was made or not. It defines everything about this case. So I called lots of people at the Houston Chronicle. I basically ran down everybody who possibly could have had any knowledge of what was going on at the Houston Chronicle at that time. And to my surprise and astonishment and, and, and happiness, I was actually able to talk to people who were at the Houston Chronicle at the time, people who would have known whether or not this kind of statement was made. And I asked them, did the Houston Chronicle receive this information? Because it had never been in any of the Houston Chronicle's articles about these murders. And the person I talked to who would know said the Houston Chronicle never got a call like that. And I asked them, well, if you had gotten that call, is it possible the police would have said, hey, don't talk about this. Don't tell anybody about this. And they said the police occasionally would ask them to withhold information that they had in, a, in an investigation like this. But if that had happened in this case, they would have known about it and it didn't happen. And this person had no reason to lie to me about this. So a couple things I think we can say for sure. This call never happened. No one ever called the Houston Chronicle and said they got the wrong Mary Morris, which raises the question, why did Laurie say that she had confirmed that? And we asked her about it. And she said she talked to somebody at the Houston Chronicle and they said this happened. And she's not sure why. And she even said, without me pointing out this conversation I'd had, that since that point, the Chronicle had denied it. So I don't know. I don't know what happened there. I don't know if she talked to somebody who was a little too exuberant and that person just wanted to confirm that this had happened and then was like, oh, shoot, when it became a national story. I don't know what happened. All I know, all I feel pretty confident in saying is that that call never happened. Right. And you begin to see why these sorts of nuggets, I think, become larger than life, even when they aren't true, because they make it seem like these two murders are tied. Now, two things, at least, that we've talked about that are not true that have tied these murders together. One the death to her being written on the calendar day in which the first Mary Morris died. Not true. It was on a blank piece of paper that was on a calendar, the blotter page. And second, that someone called Houston Chronicle and said they got the wrong Mary Morris. That call did not happen. And so when you take those away, that you begin to see why these really are just two separate murders that need to be investigated separately. Yeah, and, and just a few things. People say, how could this be possible? How could this be a coincidence? So I looked up the records, and there were nine women in 2000 named Mary Morris who died in Texas. Three of them were in Harris County, which is where these two were. So, two, so the two we know about and then another person named Mary Morris. There were 300 murders. And Harris County is huge, by the way. There were 300 murders in Harris County. That year, Mary and Morris, very common names. So even though it is striking that two of them were killed in the same sort of town within days of each other, it's almost inevitable that you would have this story eventually, right? Like, in fact, you probably do have this story. This probably happens all the time that people with the same name are killed in the same town in close proximity to each other. And just for whatever reason, probably because of Maryland, Maryland calling the coroner and that happening where there's the confusion about whether her body's been buried or not. That's probably what started this. And someone noticed it was just a matter of noticing that there were these two murders so close to each other that led to this story. But it's unlikely that the two are connected. Not impossible. We talked about, is this the worst hitman ever? He's at least tied for it. In 2006, 
there was a hitman, and we'll put the story on the website, who mistakenly killed someone with the same name as their intended target. There's a New York Post article about it. It's a 2006 contract killing gone wrong. So if it happened in the Mary Morris case, it's not the only time it's happened. So it's not impossible, albeit unlikely. Wow. I can't believe there really was a... <laughs> a hitman who killed the wrong person. Yeah, I know. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. And when you read this story, you know, I mean, look, I mean, the guy's a moron, right? I mean, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to imagine someone, someone messing up so badly. But, I mean, I'll just read you some of the story. It's from Ohio. It's out of Ohio. It's not a whole lot of details, but it says, A man accused in a 2006 contract killing in which he went to the wrong house and killed someone with the same name as the intended target has been found guilty of murder and kidnapping charges. He murdered 31-year-old Daniel Ott in Burton Township in Ohio. So it's happened before. The chances of it having happened in this case are unlikely. But hey, for those of you who want to hold on to the hitman theory, it is out there. About the phone book, I know we've talked about that a few times, and, you know, the first Mary Morris episode aired, and in that episode, I had talked a lot about how Baytown and Houston and Sugarland they are different towns. I was, you know, I kept saying Baytown and Houston are different towns. And I don't know why I didn't think of this, but a friend who lives in Houston listened to that first episode and immediately texted me and said, there's no way that... Baytown, Mary Morris would be in a Houston phone book. They have different phone books. That is such a good point. Absolutely. Baytown would have its own phone book because it's not even a neighborhood of Houston. It is just a different town altogether. So I don't think, Brett, that's been a point that's really ever been made when people point to the phone book murders or calling it that. And, you know, I even spoke to a police officer in this region who who didn't work on this case, but knew, uh, was familiar with the Mary Morris murders and immediately said, well, yeah, two Mary Morrises in one town. And so it's just, there's been a lot of lore around the phone book, but this is the biggest point. Huge shout out to my friend, Lauren. They would be in different phone books altogether. So no need for those of you who went to go research at the public library in Harris County or in Houston uh, looking for uh, an old phone book. I don't think you need to because they would just be in different phone books altogether. And this just reinforces what we've said in all these episodes, which is this is a great mystery. And what happened in both these cases needs to be uncovered. And there's a lot to talk about and to think about. And a lot of material for a podcast. But to a certain extent, the legend, the lore, as it's known and as it's been discussed these last 20 years, is manufactured. And one of the biggest things is, is this notion that there are two women with the same name in the same town, murdered in the same weekend, and therefore they must be connected. And this is just such a concrete example of how that is not true. There wasn't one phone book. So even if you are the worst hitman in the world and you go to Houston looking for Mary, or you go to Baytown or you go to Sugar Lake or whatever. Sugar Land. You know, <laughs> the, the chances, Sugar Land, sorry. Sugar Lake would be, that'd be an awesome lake. That'd be delicious. Um, but if you went to one of these towns, you know, you, you're trying to kill somebody. You're not going to mistake them for somebody else because they live in different towns. And even if you looked in the phone book, you would find... Maybe, I mean, who knows? You might find a different, there might be two Mary Morrises in Sugarland, but the chances that you're looking for one of these people and you find the other, almost, almost impossible. So look, we have given you a lot of information that you didn't know before. A lot of information about both murders that up to this point had never been revealed. This is such a fertile case for discussion. I really hope that some of you guys will take this case and make it your own. We're involved in a lot of different true crime communities. Maura Murray is a big one. And there are people in the Maura Murray case who are so dedicated to it and they're so focused on it. And they spend so much time and energy on that case trying to solve it. And I've got to, I've got to think in a case like this, if people, if people focused on this case a little bit more and they didn't sensationalize it, but they really went after it and treated it, with sort of the respect it deserves, 
I think we could get to the bottom of this one. I think there's enough information out there that we could. And everybody involved in these cases deserves that, whether it's the survivors or the victims or the people who've been accused who want to have their names cleared, whether it's Mike or Lori or Dwayne or whoever, Jay. I mean, all of these people who are involved in this case deserve to have some answers. So I hope that these three weeks have inspired you to be interested in this case and to really look into it and, and see what you can you can find because this is a case that can be solved i believe that yeah like we said this is a little bit of a different take because there was so much new information we spent less time theorizing and more putting it out there for you all to hopefully now know what the facts are because there's been a lot of things even on that have been repeated over and over again as fact that are not in fact fact. So now that you have your facts straight, now you can start to theorize about what happened and maybe encourage the police to take another look at these two murders. Yeah, and I'm interested to hear what you guys think. Reach out to us, prosecutorspod at gmail.com. All of the documents and stuff in this case will be up on our website, prosecutorspodcast.com. I hope you guys will check out Murder in My Family, where Marilyn Blaylock has her interview really good Really interesting, totally worth listening to. So I hope you'll check that out. Reach us at, at Prosecutors Pod on all the various social medias. We're on Reddit, we're on Patreon, we're on YouTube. You guys know how to find us. Check out our store on the website, buy a shirt. Keep your emails coming, keep those reviews coming. Loving all the five star reviews on Apple and keep letting us know the cases that you want us to address because those are the cases that we want to talk about well alice this has been fun i've enjoyed this um do you have anything else you want to add before we go ahead and sign off for the day no i hope everyone's staying safe and sane during this holiday season me too hope you guys all have a great holiday season merry christmas happy new year happy hanukkah let us know how your holidays go let us know all your good presents that you get alice i can't wait to find out what you what you got under the tree this year but And we'll talk more about that in the future. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. Drop at 11 o'clock central. I don't think it's as good as folklore. It's not. It's not. I didn't like the Bonnie Bear one as well as the first one. I know you didn't love folklore and you were critical of me for my love of folklore. No, no, but no. I think you're wrong. I think I said I loved folklore. It wasn't the best basic work. for liking folklore. Well, but I'm That's also basic. I was. I welcome you, in, welcome you into my basic. Ah. Because <laughs> I'm the basic one. You're not. I was just surprised you were joining me in baby. Like Bon Iver or Basic. It used to be Bon Iver was cutting edge. When did Bon Iver no, 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 become no. Bon Iver Basic? Bon Iver is not the basic one. Taylor Swift is the basic one. But they're together. together. It doesn't. It. It's kind of like money laundering. Once dirty money goes in, it's all tainted. <laughs> <laughs> it's all basic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I just made a money laundering. Oh, wow. Uh-huh.